Okay, this is uh, Dr. Joe on this uh, Wealth Wednesday. I'm looking forward to this fantastic session. We have uh, a very, very important VIP guest, uh, Mr. Scott Trench. Um, you know, you may know him um, as the president and CEO of Bigger Pocket. So it's a great honor for him to take time to be with us on this Wealth Wednesday. So again, my name is Joe Asimo, Dr. Joe. Uh, you know, let me know in the chat room who you are, where you're tuning in from. I definitely try and give you a shout out. Uh, the title today is Building Your First $500,000 in Personal Wealth. And we're going to do a real step-by-step -step approach to doing this. So how do you build 500 k in personal wealth? Uh, I think our guest is going to be uh, really uh, drilled down. And uh, I think it's going to be very actionable items he's going to share with us. So anyway, so let me, without further ado, let me just sort of do a bit uh, background. Our special VIP guest is an icon in the real estate investing arena, Scott Trench. Is a CEO and president of Bigger Pockets. Uh, you know, as many of you may know, Bigger Pockets brings together education, tools, and community for over two million plus uh, members, all in one place. It's really my go-to source for learning about investment strategies, analyzing properties, connecting with other investors and like-minded people. Uh, you know, Scott's an active real estate investor and a licensed real estate agent in the Denver, Colorado area. Uh, Scott was a fan and a member of Bigger Pockets community originally. And then he joined as an employee, as a director of operations in 2014. And he was named uh, president and CEO in 2018. For the last four years or so, Scott has been at the helm of Bigger Pockets. And uh, I've seen some tremendous growth within the organization. I'm very, very pleased with what he's done. And uh, he continues to be passionate about real estate investing. And he's a personal finance junkie. <laughs> okay, so with that said and done, there he is. Hey, thank you. That was a very, very uh, uh, detail. I felt like uh, Daenerys Targaryen, you know, and when they introduce her in Game of Thrones with all the titles in front. So, uh, all right. <laughs> well, <laughs> kudos to you, Scott. Uh, uh, again, I want to take uh, thank you very much for um, for really taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today, and I'm um, looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I know we kind of bumped together at uh, a bigger pockets at the um, BPCon 21. Uh, in New Orleans, I was sitting down at the table, and suddenly this strange guy came to me. <laughs> well, yeah, I wanted to meet you. You'd, I heard you on the podcast and loved your approach with uh, Section Eight rentals, and just what a, what a fantastic uh, you know way to build wealth and align your interests, tenant interests, uh, helping out the community. I mean, just a phenomenal approach. Exactly. So hopefully, we'll get to uh, get you know have some engaging discussions here and uh, about all things real estate, but also non real estate, really personal finance. And uh, the importance of managing money, and uh, and so on. So with that said and done, um, I know uh, you know I mentioned that you are the CEO and president of Bigger Pockets. Uh, I'm gonna bow down, you know. <laughs> yeah. Unbroken, you know, whatever. Yeah, the unburned. Yeah, uh, it's a very lofty title. But uh, what do you say to people when they say Scott? What do you actually do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, uh, integrating strategy operations people you know well, there's a whole bunch of things but what I, what I do in practice is I, I deal with the biggest problems at the business and so I never have the same priorities one quarter to the next the job I, I literally pick the top three priorities top four priorities top five whatever it is for the next 90 days and I execute those right and so I figure out hey I'm gonna do boom 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 um, and then and I'm gonna completely change my calendar to accommodate those priorities and then I'm going to complete them and then I'm going to shift again at the next quarter or if I finish them all earlier and can pivot sooner I'll do it even sooner so okay. it's literally completely every day is completely different the only constant is Tuesdays I record the money show podcast on an ongoing basis and Wednesdays we have our weekly senior leadership team meeting everything else is new sometimes it's strategy sometimes it's meeting other folks for companies that we might uh, invest in at some point. Sometimes it's hiring a uh, uh, a new leadership team member. Sometimes it's operating a part of the business that you know none of the, no one on the current leadership team can operate, and I have to get hands on with so on and so wow. forth. So it's always always a new challenge, and and that's the way I like it. As they say, never a dull day, huh? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know that uh, a few weeks ago we had um, Brandon Turner on, and we talked about leadership. And uh, the importance of leadership and different tiers of leadership. So I mean, I'm not sure if we're going to get to that, but obviously in your position, leadership is very, very critical. And uh, you know, given the direction that the organization is going, so if we get some time, we will talk about your 
your your understanding of leadership and uh, and so on. But with that said and done, let's talk about some of your your journey. I know you 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 know you're a real estate investor, you're a real estate agent. In addition to your uh, corporate responsibilities, kind of talk to us about some of the milestones, the major milestones on your journey from when you first started in uh, real estate investing or interest in real estate investing to where you are now. Some of the key milestones which you think will resonate with the audience. Yeah. So the, the journey began in 2013. I graduated college and got my first corporate job. I was making $48,000 a year as a financial analyst at a Fortune 500 company here in Denver. And uh, I decided after three months that I hated that and did not want to do that for the rest of my career. And I wanted to become financially independent and retire early. So I found a personal finance blog, a blog called uh, Mr. Money Mustache. And I was a big oh, yeah. fan of that. And I wanted to yeah. frugal my way to financial independence. And uh, I thought that was great. So I was like, oh, I can retire in 17 years. But, you know, 17 years is still a long time when you're 23. So how can I get that to be much faster? Well, maybe I can combine it with real estate investing. So I was a big fan of bigger pockets uh, from the outset of my career. Less than three months into my career, I was listening to the podcast and uh, a, a member of Bigger Pockets platform. And so in 2014, within one year of starting that, that first that job, I'd actually uh, gotten under contract for my first house hack. And I joined that startup, Bigger Pockets, as the third employee. Because uh, wow. I was like, hey, well, one, I need to reduce, one, I need to invest in real estate to reduce my housing costs through this house hack so that I can save more, uh, which will allow me to get to financial freedom that much faster. Two, I want to convert it into a rental property, which will also produce pa passive cash flow um, after I move out do this a couple times. And three, I need a career that, um, you know, can, can move a little faster potentially uh, mm -hmm. with luck than, uh, than going climbing the ranks from financial analyst one, financial analyst yeah. two, financial right. analyst three. So late, second half of 2014, pivotal moment for me. I got a new career here at Bigger Pockets, uh, joining as an, as an early employee uh, at the company, taking over the ad sales. So all the ads in the podcast, you can thank for me. You can thank me for. I know that they uh, they um, really really uh, make it. You know, thank you, thank you to all of our sponsors. So um, and then I also uh, 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 took on more and more res uh, responsibilities across the business in a general sense over the next you know three four years. Right. And then uh, when when Josh needed to leave the business for personal reasons. Um, there was an opportunity to step up and become president. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, no one's going to no, no know who you are. Your background is gone now. Exactly. <laughs> it's called, it's called, it's I got an omen for our interview here. A, a, a wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whoopsies. <So>. Anyway. <laughs> Never a dull day, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. So, uh. so, okay, so, so well, okay, that, that that that's interesting. So let's talk about the title of today's session: is building your first five hundred thousand dollars in personal wealth, and it's a very intriguing title. But before we get to that, you know, I mean, most people, including myself, we, we kind of raised in the environment of you know, you go to school you know, get good grades, get a good job, uh, work hard, you know, climb the corporate ladder, retire, be happy, and so forth. You know, I really wasn't educated on making money. I wasn't really educated on building wealth, um, you know, and so on. So for somebody who may not be familiar with all this, why should they care uh, about uh, building their first $500,000 in personal wealth? Why, why, why should, you know, I mean, surely just getting a good job, Staying there for 30, 40 years should be enough. <laughs> yeah. I mean, freedom, freedom and, and power over your life, right? That, that's that's what this is all about. Um, you know, I've heard other word, other language used to describe it. Financial dignity is one. But having, you know, wh why would you surrender power over how you spend the best part of your day for the best part of your week, for the yeah. best years of your life to a you know, somebody else to anybody else, right. That yeah. should be under your control. Um, and, and that is a, uh, in my, in my opinion, in 2022 in the United States of America, a financial, um, uh, 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 uh challenge in order yeah. to get, to gain that power. Uh, and so it, it comes down to having liquid cash that you can spend passive income that again, you can spend on, on, on lifestyle goals and alternatives to, um, you know, the middle-class trap, um, of, of having large amounts of consumer debt, large amount, a huge home mortgage and no wealth other than what's in your home equity or your 401k balance. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not freedom. That's, that's a trap. You're, you're kind of, you're completely stuck and you're completely out of money within mm -hmm. weeks or months of leaving a corporate job. That's how most Americans live yeah. most of their lives. 
I, I just think that's, that, that's not a good way to approach life. There's so much more out there. There's so much opportunity that you're just missing. You can't even conceive of with a weak mm-hmm. financial position like that. Um, mm-hmm. That's why, that's why I think the stakes are. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. So, okay. So I bought into this thing. I need, I want to make half a million dollars and uh, build my wealth and get financial independence, financial freedom and so on. But, but Scott, I have no money. So where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what, one caveat, when I, whenever I talk about uh, the, the, the journey to financial independence, the starting point is a median income, right? Median income and no assets. I assume that you have no assets, no debt, and a median income. Some people start way worse than that with a, a mu- far below median income and, um, and, and low assets. If that's you, then the first step is how do I get to a median income? Right. And, and that's that's a challenge. You know, bigger pockets. I think we do a lot of great work for folks and helping them build wealth. But you're not going to get into real estate investing if you don't have a median income um, and, and, you know, a, a, at least a close to zero net worth to begin building off of. So mm-hmm. anyways, that's that's the starting point. So I do want to caveat this is how to okay. get to your first five hundred thousand dollars from a standing start with little to no assets and a median or close to it income. Okay, um, good. Now, if you're going to if you're going to build wealth, uh, and you're starting from that position, you have, you have four levers. One is spend less. The second is earn more. The third is invest. And the fourth is create. You can do any combination of those four things and they all can work. You, we hear about entrepreneurs who create businesses uh, to, to, to produce assets. We have uh, uh, people who have large investment bases who can generate passive income. We have people who can earn high incomes. We have people who can frugal their way. You should do a combination, but we, we're going to apply each of those levers are going to be more or less important depending on which stage of the journey that you're in. Mm-hmm. And when you're working a full-time job, earning a median income, I'm going to suggest that you're probably already optimized on the income front. If you could get a job that paid much more, you probably would have taken it uh, if it offered the same combination of lifestyle circumstances. You're probably already optimized. You have no assets to invest and you have no time except for the hours after work and on the weekends maybe to build a business, to create. So that leaves us with one lever, which is unfortunately spend less. That I think the journey to building wealth starts with frugality for the median income earner. I have to yeah. cut back that spending and try to get that as low as possible. And okay. ideally, I'm going to get it to 50% of my income. And that's extreme, right? I did that when I was a single 23-year-old. Um, I probably would have a much harder time as a married 32-year-old today, right? That would be a much more difficult challenge. But it's still, it still does not change the fact that you are married or have a family or kids or anything like that does not change the the, the fact that spending less is likely to be the most important lever in the beginning stages of this journey. So now, okay, that's not, that's, I'm, I'm still spouting the obvious here. What do I do next? Well, let's take American household spending and create a pie chart. Where is that spending going? Right now, you can find this at the National Bureau of Labor Statistics. You can look it up online, um, or you can just analyze your own spending. But I'll guarantee you that most of your spending, or the biggest chunks of your spending, are likely to be your housing, mm-hmm. your transportation, and your food expense. Mm-hmm. And that's where we have to focus first. So most people, when they think about how do I get my spending low, how do I get to fifty percent? No, I'm I'm going to start. You know, I'm going to cut back on my entertainment budget. I'm going to cut back on my booze budget. I'm going to spend less on uh, eating out. Those are all good things. But really what you should be focusing on is how do I eliminate or drastically reduce those fixed expenses? How do I, can I get a roommate? Can I house hack? Um, which I think is one of the most important um, tactics to get into this. Uh, and how do I get, uh, how do I lower that cost of housing from like 2000 a month, maybe if I'm sitting on a rent to 1000 or $800 a month and stack that cash for that first year? And it sucks. It's a, it's a lifestyle change. When I was doing that, I was living in a, in a, in a kind of crappy apartment, you know, 25 minutes away from downtown while my friends were living in a really nice apartment downtown in the city. And it was like, you know, and I had a roommate instead of my, my own, my own, my own, um, my own place. And that was a big difference, but I was able to save an extra thousand, twelve hundred dollars per month, for example, doing that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's one on the transportation front. I think that the best option is walking or biking to work or taking public transit if you can. Uh, and then the second best option is going to be to buy a cheap economy vehicle, right? There's no reason to have a four wheel drive uh, vehicle, except for in very select parts of the country um, on very select par- parts of the time. And even if you, and, and even if you, you do have like a big snow day or whatever, just Uber to work that day and you're going to come out way ahead. But the car purchase is such a, hu- is such a massive um, uh, uh, decision that you can make. Now, if you're already stuck in a housing situation or have a car like that, then know that 
these are not overnight decisions. You're not going to get to a 50% savings rate and start stockpiling $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 a month in cash overnight. It's a process. When the lease comes up or the next opportunity to move comes up, you make a major decision about your housing that can keep that low for the next several years. You make a major decision about that car purchase that's going to be able to keep the expenses very low, leave as much cash as possible in your bank account, and keep the maintenance costs, costs low. Right? We're not doing the cheapest option. We're doing the most frugal option, the one that's going to be the best value. Right? Okay. A uh, eight-year-old Corolla, for example, for $12,000 um, might be better than a $3,000 junker that's going to get um, messed up in the, within the next year or two. But it. It, it, it's about making that value-oriented yeah. decision. Okay. And then, again, on the, on the, on the uh, food expense, it's about basic planning and preparation, reasonable purchases from reasonable grocery stores and planning those meals in advance. And if you do those three things over the next year, you make a really good frugal housing decision, okay. vehicle decision, and then um, you plan out those meals and cook okay. most of those meals yourself. You're going to be able to start, you're going to be able to make a major dent in your savings compared okay. to that. Those are big decisions. So that's okay. the first twenty five thousand dollars. That's how you do it. Is you, okay, is, is you let, let, let me play. OK, so let me just summarize what let me make sure I've got this, uh, Scott. We're starting off from uh, the medium income. We started with no assets. And, it, you know, obviously, you know, we're limited to what we can do. And it seems that the best way to start is to spend less. Mm -hmm. OK. And, uh, you know, if you want to spend less then you focus on the big stuff not cutting down Starbucks from three times a week to, to two times a week, uh, and say $5. <laughs> That's okay. not gonna cut it. You, you cut the, you look at the big stuff, which are, uh, uh, housing, uh, transportation and food. Okay. That's, right. uh, and that's two thirds of your household spending. Housing and transportation are 33% and 17% respectively. And then food is another 13%. So 63% of household spending is of those three categories okay. alone. That's exactly. it. Game over. You 50% savings rate if you can get those down. Now, what yeah. if, um, you know, I'm going to play devil's advocate, uh, Scott. So, I mean, I don't believe this, but it is what it is. I just want to play it out. Well, Scott, my spouse, my partner, you know, likes to spend a lot of money. You know, likes the bling bling, you know, the doodahs, as uh, Robert Kiyosaki <laughs> used to say. Uh, how do you get her? How? What do I need to tell him or her? So that they can get on board with this. Um, so, so I think there's uh, a, a good. So first of all, that is not an overnight decision. Again, right? This is not. This is not something you're going to solve next week. This is a process. Don't make it an event. Otherwise, it will be a lifetime event that you will not uh, enjoy talking about in future years. But make it a process, right? And, and a great tool, I think, for this is a vision document. This is literally a, this is like people overthink this this vision concept and they think it's like a a major thing they have to get perfect. No, write down on a piece of paper. Half page of piece of paper. Draft. Use the word draft. That 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 always helps okay. us in this. Uh, vision for our lives or something like that. 2026. Something mm -hmm. three year, three to five years out. And then say, you know, uh, hey, we want to be in this uh, location that's overlooking the water. We want to have a beautiful view. We want to have a house like this. We want to have the uh, 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 you know two happy kids running around. We want to have a cat and a dog. We want to spend our, we want to wake up at this time. We want to do that. Like put those things on, on a piece of paper that you think right. you'd like. And right. if you, you know, you're hopefully your spouse will like a lot of the things you, that you like, and then sure. say, what, what do you think of this? Do you, do you like this? And yeah. then, you know, see what their reaction is. And hopefully yeah. if they're engaged, they will edit yeah. your draft. They will not yeah. just take exactly what you said. They said, no, I want this. I'd like yeah. to be doing this. This is how I like to do for work. Um, and now once you have that document, you can say, is that more important than these other things that yeah. we're spending money on? And can yeah. we, how do we design a financial position that can actually back into that? So that's yes. one tool that yes. I would suggest as part of this. And then you can begin backing into goals. So I am an incredible nerd about this. And I brought this to my honeymoon. Uh, we did it over, we did it while, <laughs> while overlooking the ocean uh, well, after, after the first day. And then we put together some quarterly goals and we update those quarterly goals each quarter. And we do a nice little date and sometimes a little trip alongside it. We look forward to it, you know, and I, and I think you should also do that that conversation when you're in what I call peak state, you're, you're, you're very happy. You've uh, maybe had your coffee right after a nice breakfast in the morning. You're not, uh, it's not, you're not tired right. on a Thursday afternoon right after a but, long but, day but, of work. But, but, but I mean, but you know, the consumer society that we live in and it's all sort of uh, based on people spending, 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 people kind of get sucked into that trap. 
And uh, so, you know, if you're dating somebody, you want to have a long term relate. When do you have that discussion? Because if you don't have it early and that per you're not on the same page, I could see a major conflict brewing because, you know, you're here, they're there. And, you know, it's it's a that's why you put the words draft in all capital letters at the right. beginning of the document, because you do not want to present a vision for, for your life that you, that your partner may be completely at odds with. You want yeah. to put, present something that, Hey, I'm coming to you with a draft. I'd yeah. love to have your input and discuss it. Yeah. Would you do this with me? Yeah. Um, okay. Surely they will, they will be able to, yeah. to, to respond somewhat yeah. proactively to that. Now I have another tool. If for some, for some reason that does fail, then the next tool would be to go with separate finances and cool. do that and say, Hey, there's no, you know, a lot of, a lot of couples do that. And a lot of couples do it very successfully. And then yeah. you can achieve financial independence on your own with your separate finances and they can work on theirs and you can, yeah. you know, share some expenses for housing and those types of things or whatever, okay. but that's another viable yeah. approach. But I okay. think that the, the vision approach may be better. Yeah. Now, and, and another, another tool on this is um, a, a, a financial um, guru that I really admire is uh, Tiffany Aliche. And she has this concept of four, she has four buckets for spending, right? Okay. Needs, wants, likes, loves. Okay. Right? And if you spend and where you want to have your spending is in your needs and your loves category, right? And that means that you can't have your needs, your wants, your likes, and your loves. So you have to give up the wants and the yeah. likes in order yeah. to get to the needs and the yeah. loves. And, yeah. and that's a good way to bucket that expense, those expenses okay. in there uh, as another toolkit and to say, what, which of these expenses are needs, which are yeah. wants, which yeah. are likes, and which are yeah. loves. And hopefully your loves are the things that move you towards that vision. Like, yeah. you know, the beautiful sunset view, the nice, the, the, the house the, with the the plenty of time to hang around with the the prancing kids and all that kind of stuff. Not and not the you know sushi takeout order. But what but, what do you say to those again? Just a final uh, devil's advocate question. I know when I've listened to some of these gurus who talk about a scarcity mindset. You know, uh, we should live in an abundance mindset, and therefore we need to focus on you know not so much on uh, expenses, but boosting our our income. You, so if you, you, you're familiar with that that kind of approach that some of these gurus say, you know, let's focus on not so much saving money, but boosting our income yeah, as so opposed to, as a way to make money. First, I hope that we spend 15 minutes on spending and 45 minutes on income and investing. So th there, that's 100 percent correct, yeah. right? Is that that's that is most of the journey is is yeah. uh, but the beginning stages, yeah. you, you know, for the media income thing. earner, yeah. what are you gonna do? You, yeah. You're going to quit your job because you yeah. have no savings. You probably exactly. spend everything you have. You're going to run out of right. cash within two weeks. You yep. cannot leave your job. You have yep. to build up a financial runway and yep. build yourself a, found, a foundation. And it's a Got year. It. It's 25 grand okay. you, you know, or something to that effect, of like six okay. months to a year of savings. And then yeah. you have this, this foundation where you can say, yeah. no, yeah. This, this career is not serving yeah. me. I'm going to go and I'm going to do something that's scalable. But the cost of that scalability yeah. is risk. I might lose yeah. income or have a smaller yeah. income or yes. need to be more commission-based for a few yeah. months to get that going. You just can't right. do it without that that yeah. low spending base and yeah. some cash in the bank. Yeah. That's why it's first. It's the first yes. lever, not the most yes. important. And, and what do you do with the money that you save? Because obviously there's... Um, you know, you can stock it away in the savings account. You could maybe pay off some old bills. You could pay off some credit card. I mean, what do you do with the, the first 25K that we we have saved? You know, yeah. what do we do with it? Because we're going to go to step two, which is sort of building the first 100,000. But at this point, we, you know, we, we've been very, very diligent on our cutting our housing expenses. We've been very uh, fr uh, frugal on our other expenses. And uh, and so we're doing all the things that you sort of, uh, so we saved 25K. What do we do with that money? So as as you're saving up the, the as as you're starting to accumulate cash, the first thing you should do is pay off bad debt, right? Bad debt. I, I everyone has a different definition. I'm going to call it everything over a seven or eight percent interest rate or anything that's delinquent that's hurting your credit score. Pay it off and get current on that. Once okay. you get below that, you know, then then I think it's about putting it into something that's highly liquid. Now I'll admit when I when I did this, I put it into stock market index funds because I couldn't wait to get started investing. That's okay. not the best choice. And if I was repeating it again, I would probably put it just in a in a, in a, in a savings account. But I know that's irresistible for folks that are in, grinding out this first year of slog to save up this this first twenty five k um, to at least invest some of it. So completely get that. But I would I would recommend a, 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 a cash position. But um, if you need to invest it in something, do it in something that you could actually sell tomorrow 
um, like publicly traded securities. Okay, so. got it. Okay, so okay, so we got the twenty five k. We paid off our bad bad debts, and we're sort of uh, looking to you know investing in or putting our money into good uh, vehicles, whether it be securities or whatever it is. And therefore, we now want to go to the next step, which I think is what's the next step on our, on this on this journey. So have. the next step is going from 25 to 100. Um, okay. Again, these are arbitrary numbers. You might be, want to save up 30. You might want to save up 150 before you move these steps. But okay, so now that we have low spending, the next two levers are investing and earning more. Right, those are the other two things. So, what you know, as as a median income now, if you're if you're earning 200 grand a year as a software engineer, you're not a median income earner, right? So you don't need to focus on earning more money. You should just you know you get a raise, keep doing good work there, and then spend. A, 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 on a you know a middle class lifestyle, and you're going to accumulate hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and get rich quick. But if you're a median income earner, you're probably not going to be able to increase your income by continuing to do what you do in any sort of rapid fashion. So that's where you need to think: okay, how do I switch careers here? How do I get into software engineering? Do I attend one of these boot camps, for example, mm -hmm. to learn that? Do I go get my real estate license and begin selling properties on the sides of my nights and weekends? Mm -hmm. Do I, uh, uh, the notary uh, uh, route has been very popular. That's a way to make hundreds of extra dollars a week. And I know a few folks that have gone on to do that and quit their job and make $100,000 a year um, with more work. So there's there's a ton of things, but you're gonna what you're gonna have to do is either moonlight at first to develop that skill, or you're gonna have to leave that median income job in order to go focus full time on these things that have more potential. And the agent uh, real estate broker ex example is a really good one because um, what happens there is you're gonna leave your corporate job and then you're gonna become an agent. You're not gonna earn income like you did previously. You're not gonna get paid a base salary or bet with benefits. You're gonna get paid you know, maybe four, five, six commissions that first year if you're, if you're doing reasonably well um, as a full-time agent and hustling. And that's going to be 50, 60 grand with no benefits. You can't do that without a, a, a savings nest. Now, the, in, in future years, as you get ramped up, you may make many, many times that amount, hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. Um, but it's, it's about changing the job and using that financial runway that you've accumulated uh, in those first couple of years to be the propeller for a uh, an opportunity that can actually generate more income. So that's part one. Part two, in my opinion, is you got to consider the house hack. The house hack is not a requirement to get wealthy, but it is the single most powerful tool for the median income earner, starting with little to no assets, to get to a few hundred thousand dollars in, in personal net worth in a reasonable yeah. period of time. There, it's just housing is your biggest expense. Yeah. And unless you're living in your parents' basement, it's going to be a really expensive um, a part of your, port your profile. And it's just such a powerful tool for th three to 5% down. You can buy a property that potentially completely, you know, like a, a, that has a short-term rental component or that has additional units that can completely or materially offset the cost of living um, for your house. So okay. I think it's, a, I think it's an almost must for the median income earner trying to get yeah. to their first few hundred thousand dollars in personal wealth to, to consider that. So what if the person lives in a um, expensive area. Uh, I know where we are in the Washington DC area. I'm sure where you are in Denver and other people, uh, other markets, it's kind of expensive. So, um, you know, if, if it's to save three, five, 10%, uh, in a, in a, in an expensive area, it takes time. So uh, my question, I suppose is, uh, can you house hack a rental? Interesting. Uh, is, is it primarily just for people who own? Uh, well, I, it is possible to arbitrage a lease. So, you know, um, you know, you should definitely talk to the landlord ahead of time. Although some people um, will talk about not, you know, asking forgiveness, not permission um, with that. But you can rent out a place and then, you know, sublet it for on Airbnb, for example. But I would, I would definitely talk to your landlord before yeah, well, that. Well, I was thinking was that, for instance, um, uh, you know, you just say you're a single person, you may rent a two bedroom. And, uh, and rent the, uh, you know, have a, a roommate as the, um, for the second bedroom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and therefore the rent from that roommate will offset the total rent that you're paying every month. Uh, is, is that, is that technically, that's where that's technically, that's not called house hacking really, is it? It's just, is, or is it? Yeah. Is it I mean, if you, can, if you can find a great deal that, yeah. that, so look, look, I think what you're asking is in, in some markets and in some areas, 
um, house hacking is impractical because the price, the, the housing prices are, there's so, housing is so scarce yeah. that yeah. it's not really a median income thing. It's a multiples of median income is yeah. what it takes. Like San Francisco, very yeah. impractical to, to house hack in San Francisco um, and maybe New York as well, although I'm sure people can creatively do it. But yeah. I would say in most other markets, um, which would include DC and a lot of yeah. East Coast cities, there are different pockets of town that have yeah. different ho ha yes. housing at different price points. And guess what? Like you, you, you the goal here, you, you're not going to live in like, yeah your favorite location yeah. yes. in the best part of town, right. exactly yeah. where you want to be with the sunset view yeah. of the mountain right. the and spot. the best school district exactly. and achieve financial freedom very early in life in the first few years. Now, yeah. what you can do is you can live in a place that is going to be low cost, that is mm -hmm. going to give you a great opportunity to house hack that may make a good long-term rental downstream. And you do that for a few years and it may not be your optimal living environment. And then for the rest of your life, you'll have passive income and wealth that you can mm -hmm. use to mm -hmm. pay for that yeah. optimal life. And yeah. that's, that's the trade-off here, right? Is, right? is we want to get rich to $500,000 and yeah. you know, uh, go from zero to 500,000 in a few years and okay. get yourself on the other side of this capitalism okay. equation where, where yep. your wealth is working for you. You got to make some changes with that. Yep. And it's not going to be um, okay. super fun. So, uh, so, so let me see, make sure I can make sure uh, we're here now. We've saved our 21st, 25K. We now want to uh, continue on this runway to get to 100,000. There's different ways to get that. We all may have skills, uh, different skill sets that we've developed over the way. Um, you know, you may have an interest in um, you know, real estate, therefore you could become a real estate agent. You may have interest in um, you know, a hobby that you have that you can generate some money. So the idea is to leverage the talents and skills that you have to boost your income stream. Uh, or, your, your, your or develop a new one. Sometimes or, you got to throw your yeah. hands up and say, I don't have any skills yeah. that are actually monetizable. And yeah. so I'm going to go and I'm going to learn to be a software engineer, or I'm going to yeah. go and I'm going to become a real estate yeah. agent, or I'm going to yeah. go and become an electrician right. um, and go that, that that route, because those are, that's yeah. better than my, you know, fashion degree, which, you know, yes. my co-host yeah. Mindy Jensen got majored in fashion design and, and yeah. as a very, okay. uh, you know, talks about how that wasn't, how that wasn't helpful for her, but you, you might have to throw your hands on and say, I got to go on a new career track and I'm going to yeah. use my baseline to yeah. invest in myself, which is got a much it. better investment than the S and P 500 or yes. even a real estate investment is having yeah. that freedom. Got it. And then in parallel with that, you know, we can sort of go the house hacking rack route. And, uh, so in that case, obviously there are low, most, most places, most jurisdictions have first time home buyer programs. Uh, whereby you may get grants, you may get lower interest rate uh, loans. I mean, there's lots of uh, enticements and encouragements that the state and the local authorities give you. So explore those and leverage those to start on your journey towards acquiring real estate. Yeah, and if you have $25,000 in cash, if you have good credit and yes. you earn a median income, yes. in all but a few markets in the country, there yes. will be creative opportunities for yes. you to figure something out, whether yes. it's a rent by the room house yes. hack, whether it's an Airbnb, whether you know, whatever it is. But there will be there are opportunities. Like right now in Denver, I'll give you an example. The the move is um uh that I, I heard from a local agent um named Ben Einspar. He he says, buy a, a five bedroom house somewhere in the Denver city limits and um, live in the basement and Airbnb out the top or um, live or yeah. rent by the room with each of those. And yeah. why do you do the Airbnb? Because in Denver, you can't Airbnb your property unless you live in the property. So that's not a stable, you know, scalable right. long-term solution. Right. But yeah. while you're house hacking there, you have yeah. no competition from yes. professional short-term rentals. Yes. You only have people who are owner occupants. So you can drive, yeah. you have pr such incredible pricing power. It's a cheat code to getting started uh, in wealth, not a barrier uh, for, for those first time home buyer, for those yeah. first time house hackers, because yes. they're because they have such an enormous advantage in this room. And then you turn it into a medium term rental or a rent yes. by the room when you yes. move out. Yes. Okay, got that one because I know that's how I started. I think that well, the second house I bought, uh, I bought a house. I mean, it wasn't called house hacking then. This was in the eighties, before probably before you were born. <laughs> and uh, well, you know, what they call it then. <laughs> what? What they call it? What they call it back in the old days? I just, I just, how can I live in the house without paying any money? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I call it. <laughs> the term house hacking wasn't invented, so how the hell can I live in this house and not pay any money? So I bought this first house. I rented the basement out. Uh, so it was an English basement. So I rented that out. There has three bedrooms upstairs. I lived in one and rented the other two. And so essentially, I had zero. My, in fact, I was making money from my house. And therefore, the income I was making for my job 
uh, I saved that, which then allowed me to buy a house number three, the number four, and, and, and kept on going. So it's 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 a fantastic strategy. It makes sense. I've done it. I'm a, a, a you know an advocate of that one, and it really is a powerful way to get on that train. And do you still journey. house hack? Pardon? Do you still house hack? Uh, I was the, the house that we lived in when I first bought it here. Uh, we house hacked it, um, and uh, so we had a basement. It's a big house. It's just my wife and I at that time. And but do, we do you still do you still house hack your house, your primary? That's uh, I don't anymore. Yeah. I, I used to when I when I first bought it, but I I used I rented the basement out. Now I use the basement as an office. And that's the key is this is not permanent. This yeah. is a journey. You are going yeah. to become financially free early yeah. in life. And you yeah. have a great shot at doing this in five to 10 years of building a nest yeah. egg. And yeah. then you have the passive income from multiple exactly. port properties and wealth that you can just like live in the nice place without the encumbrance of being dependent yeah. on a wage on wage income. Sure. Well, what, what if you, I mean, again, pay another devil's advocate. Um, what if you have a spouse who, well, I don't want to live with strangers. You well, know, that's where well, you have to align on the vision. You have to say, here, yeah. here's what we're here's what we're willing to do. Uh, here's what we want to get to. How badly do we want it, right? And and look, a lot of people are not going to badly want financial freedom to the point where they're going to be like, okay, let's sell our million dollar home and move into one for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars with a neighbor next door um, that we have to that we're responsible for managing, right? And that's like, I get it. That's just not going to be practical. So in that case, what you what you're going to have to do is. The, the, the rules of finance do not change yeah. because your spouse is not aligned with this. So you yeah. just need to come together in alignment yeah. and say, we're yeah. going to go much slower towards this. My, yes. th the journey is not going to be overnight. I'm going to have yeah. to work harder. I'm going to have to figure yeah. out other ways to earn more. I'm going to have to yeah. expand my time horizon. I'm going to have to yeah. change my investing profile. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to have to go to Q&A very shortly. So for those who've got questions, uh, start putting them in the chat and we'll get to those shortly. So again, if you've got questions for Scott, on this great topic, uh, building uh, your know, first half a million dollars. Uh, please put it in. We'll go to Q&A very, very shortly. So another question, uh, Scott, is that um, if should the first house that you buy under this approach be a local or, or, or does it matter if you go out of state? I, I, I think it should be local for the most okay. part. So I um if you're gonna if you're getting started from a median, if you earn a median income and have no assets and you're trying to build wealth, I think that a local house hack is gonna be the move for ninety-eight percent of the markets in the country. Yes. You know, maybe ninety five percent of the markets in the country. Um okay. and, and that includes expensive places like Denver, Austin, um, Seattle. Portland, everything, I think, except maybe, you know, I think, I think in all those markets, you're going to be better off with a house hack than you are with an out of state, um, uh, rental, um, most likely in terms of your ability to build wealth, uh, okay. risk adjusted. You don't have to make the decision for your, yourself, yeah. but I would heavily bias you towards that first one being in your local market. Um, okay. okay. So at this point, okay, we've got our hundred thousand, uh, we've uh, accumulated a hundred thousand dollars in wealth by house hacking, uh, increasing leveraging our skills and do some uh, wise investing. So how do we get from 100,000 to 500,000? So now, now, now the, the, the grind begins, right? You're continuing to scale your income because you've chosen a scalable career. You've got a, you, you, you know, you're, you're, if you're a software engineer, you're getting big raises. If you're a contractor, you're, you're increasing your, um, you're increasing your book of business and your profit margin on those deals. If you're a, uh, agent, you're, you're increasing your sales profile or a notary. You're doing that, right? So you're scaling that income and then you're investing according to a system. And this is where, you know, you could, you could say rental property investing. Now I'm going to go and either pick my local market or I'm going to pick an out-of-state market that I can sustain an investment in every year or every 18 months or something like that. And I'm going to consistently invest in one or, or two or three, I think three is at most, asset classes um, that I believe are likely to appreciate and generate cash flow for me. So my preferred approach personally is I dump money in index funds every single month and I buy a rental property every 12 to 18 months here in Denver, Colorado. Just consistent, super boring. They're all the same. It's I, I own VOO, um, the, the, the S&P 500 Vanguard Index Fund. And I have uh, 13 units here in Denver, Colorado across five properties. They're all 1950s builds. They're all two bed, one bath properties, except for one duplex. That's five bed, three bath. Um, and, uh, on each unit and they're all like, they're all the same year built. They're all the same style. They're like, it's just super consistent, boring. And I just buy every, uh, uh, periodically 
every year or so. And, and that formula for me works. I just continue to stockpile it and, and it's, and it's, and I'm not getting rich quick, but I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm getting it rich consistently over time. And I can, I can sustain this approach for the duration of my life if I want. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's, let's dig a deep, deeper into that. Uh, um, we don't hear a lot about investing in securities in bigger pockets. It's all about uh, most of the time it's investing in real estate. Um, why are you a proponent of both? Well, yeah, you don't listen to Bigger Pockets Money, apparently. So, yeah, no, uh, <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> so, so bigger, yeah, bigger Bigger Pockets. But we talk about all the time. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but but yeah, but the, the the truth of the matter is is that real estate investors on Bigger Pockets, almost all of them invest in stock and stock market in addition to their rental property portfolio. So, what's very common is our investors will purchase you know stocks and bonds in their 401ks or Roth IRAs, yes. and then they'll use the remaining proceeds to purchase real estate. So I do the exact same thing. I have uh, stocks in my in my in my Roth and, and 401ks, yeah. and yeah. then I have an after-tax brokerage account which I contribute to stocks yeah. in addition to that. Yeah. I have an emergency reserve, and I have real estate, yes. and I, and I and I do that. And I think that's a really nice balanced portfolio. I okay. think if you're a hundred percent into real estate, you should probably consider lowering your 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 right. debt ratio. You know, you, you should probably right. consider. Right. You, yeah. you want to you want to you know. I think that I think I don't think I love real estate. I don't think people should be 100% into real estate for the most part. I mean, there's a few outliers right. on bigger pockets, maybe have 95% of no. their net worth right. in there. And that's fine. But I yeah. bet you that the majority of those folks are going to be le very yeah. lately leveraged, have a very strong cash position, which yes. is great. So Okay. So the security strategy that you have is mainly index funds, which, you know, you put money in, you don't have to monitor every hour, mm -hmm. uh, every second of the day. It just, you know, comes, it follows the market, um, you know, over a period of time, which is great. Now, in terms of the rentals, uh, the real estate portfolio. Why did you pick the criteria that you chose? You know, um, you know. Well, the the first the okay. So the first criteria is I have to believe in that location over the yeah. next thirty years. So I I think that you know if I hold this property for the next thirty years, I'm not going to regret it. And and it's a very simple test. There's yeah. a lot of. Uh, detail that can go into that. You know, what's the neighborhood like? What are there any improvements being planned? Where is it in relation to the city? What's the path of progress? All, all those types of questions um, that you can ask. What's the zoning? Um, what are the other units like on the block? Those types of things. Um, so that that's one. Um, and, and after that, I, I generally prefer to have the same types of problems. So I'm I know what I'm going to get with these types of builds in Denver. I'm used to that. I know what that what what the what you know what the cost to re replace that type of roof is going to be. Yes. What the cost you know uh, to you know any type of foundation issues and that kind of stuff. I'm just you know the siding is the same. So I'm just used to doing that, and I can tell. So it's more of a comfort thing yeah. really than yeah. a uh, than a real like. Yeah. Oh, this is the best ROI. I'm just used to dealing with those types of problems, and I yeah. feel comfortable with that. I do yeah. one one issue I do think is important is I like um, two bed one bath units in an mm -hmm. average market condition, or one bed wow. one bath unit, because I think that uh -huh. those are very rentable. They're probably not great for your strategy, Doctor Joe, with the Section Eight um, right. side of things. But for what you know, most of my tenants are not Section Eight, so okay. for that, it's very easy to rent a two bed, one bath unit. They're always going to be in demand. One bed, one bath are always going to be in demand. Okay. I have one five bed, three bath unit that is an exception to that, and that's been fantastic because there's very little competition um, okay. for properties that are that large that allow okay. pets and stuff. And so that's been that's been a winner for me. But but I, I probably will stick with that bread and butter two bed, okay. one bath unit formula. Okay. Yeah, because I, I found that um, the key, obviously, in that strategy, if you buy this asset in this great area that you just talked about, is the system or processes for keeping that asset, which means that you got to deal with tenants, finding good tenants, finding quality tenants, and, and you know, tenants that's going to pay you to take care of the property and things like that. So uh, do you want to share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think there's a learning curve associated with investing in real estate that's on the order of 500 hours of self education. Now I'm biased. I think you should spend that time on bigger pockets um, in places like you know with, with Dr. Joe here uh, to to learn that. But I think that that's I think that's the price tag to get into this business. And tenant management is one part of that, right? I mean, you need to have a framework around this. How am I going to do that? What's my screening checklist? What's my credit score limit? Am I going to I how am I going to think about evictions? I don't want you know for me, I want a credit score above a certain number, usually 650 at a very at an absolute minimum. I want want um, no eviction history. And then I'm going to make, you know, I, I'm going to have a policy I, on, on criminal history, right? Like if you've been arrested for marijuana use, 
I'm not going to count that against you and you're going to be fine uh, on this. You know, so Theft, for example, though, might be more of an issue. And so you need to come up with a policy for those types of things in the screening. When There's also, you know, I, what I like to do when I'm managing myself, I no longer manage myself, but when I was managing myself, I would have the tenants fill out an application. There would be employment history for the last two years. I'd call up the employers. I'd call up the landlords from the last three years and ask for references from those landlords. Um, and, and I'd, you know, make, double check and make sure I could get that same number by doing a Google search, because sometimes the tenants will give you their friends instead of the landlords. But going through all of that, that work to screen the tenant up front is a lifesaver. If you don't do this work up front, if you don't invest the hundreds of hours to get this right, you're going to pay it back on the back end and you're going to cost money. So you're going to you're going to put in the time either way. You can either do it up front and save yourself some money, or you can do it uh, you can do it at the back end and after you've already had the the, the nightmare situation. Uh, Doctor Joe, I think you might be muted. All right. Oh. <laughs> oh, there he is. He's back. <laughs> How about that? About That's better. Yep. Apologies for that technical issue. I think we're all, you know, we're, we're you know, we're definitely in sync. Uh, in fact, to, I mean, I like the, as you know, I like the bigger houses. Um, if I just came uh, today, I had a house which uh, I've owned for six years. The last tenant just left and I showed it for the first time today. Um, four bedroom house. And 10 applications uh, today. And, um, you know, it's, it's the demand is there. You pick the niche that you that, you know, that you, you sort of gravitate to screen well and manage well. And if you do that, then hold on to the real estate asset because it will generate income. It will give you tax benefits. It will appreciate in value. And that's how a fast way of getting from 100,000 to 500,000 that we kind of talked about. And mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So it's uh, I love real estate. I love being a landlord. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, and what you do a great job of that I've learned from you really well is is the 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 going above and beyond for your tenants um, to make sure that they're happy and they stay for a yes. very long time because yes. occupancy can kill you um, on this. Yeah, yeah. I so, said I mean I, I had a session a couple of weeks ago uh, where I, I invited some of my tenants on. I had one tenant that's been with me twenty five years and uh, had a. You know, I'm 18 year tenants, 15 year tenants, 12 year. I mean, I mean, I mean, you just save so much money in terms of the turnover cost. It really, uh, and also you make a difference, a huge difference. At least I do anyway. And these people have lives. paid off your property. Exactly. I mean, uh, she's been there 25 years on a 15 year mortgage. Uh, bought the house for 120,000. It's a 900 thousand dollar block now. Uh, it's. It, I mean, it really does work. Real estate over time. Just be patient, as you say. Let yeah. time work for you and be strategic where you buy and uh, and just be patient because it does work. And, and capitalize and keep your properties, uh, you know, cash flowing and occupied, right? Yes. Because because that yeah. works. But yeah. like I guarantee you, you, you had some scares with property values where the market wasn't, you know, zooming up 10% for all of those 25 years, right? So, well, yeah, but I mean, you know, but I take a long-term view, just like what you do. Uh, mm -hmm. Take a long-term view over time, uh, especially if you pick the right market. Uh, you know, it tends to work itself out. Consistent, uh, but not aggressive. Exactly, and so on. Okay, so we are now 8.50, uh, or 7.50, sorry. We are, let's go down some questions, because I, I could be talking with Scott all day. And uh, so my, uh, let's put some questions on. So the first one we've got is Malachi. Uh, if you haven't purchased your primary residence yet, do you think your first purchase should be a multi-unit, if you can, or a single-family home where you house hack? Good question. What's your thoughts, uh, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I I think that the the multi-unit house hack is cleaner. That's the way I started with this, but I also realized that it's not as practical as it was. I don't think with a median income you're going to have as much success finding a great house hack duplex as I was able to get in 2014, for example. Mm -hmm. So I've I, the 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 concept of the rent by the room property, or I think the the best option is the ADU with the main property. Um, that you can Airbnb or short-term rental. Mm -hmm. I, I like the Airbnb. That if you can find a place that has a basement or a separate, completely separate mother-in-law unit and live in that second unit and rent out the main property, I think that's going to be the best possible house hack and probably where I would be starting if I was starting over today. Yes. Good question, Malachi. Okay, another question. Serge. Hi, Serge. 
Outstanding show. What books, if Scott is currently reading, and would you recommend? Awesome. I am currently um, I'm currently reading a book called Crib Sheet, which is uh, for new parents because um, I'm about to have a we're about to have a baby coming in uh, in October. I will miss the conference, unfortunately, as the baby is scheduled to, to arrive at the same time as the conference. So that that's one. Um, I'm reading a book on jobs theory. Uh, let me, it's called Competing Against Luck, which is fen phenomenal. It's how to when you're building a product or a service, you need to think about not what your competitors are doing, not what not improving your own product, but what job is your customer trying to do, right? What is our, what job is a bigger pockets member trying to do? They're trying to spend hundreds of hours to become an expert, confident real estate investor. How do we serve them and helping them do that, for example? So those are the two books that I'm, I'm reading. Uh, a book that I'd recommend, one of my favorite books of all time, uh, I'm going to go to and I, and I'll, I'll all the Bigger Pockets books, um, of course, um, for that. But I, I always think it's cheating to plug the Bigger Pockets books. Um, but you know, of course, of course, we we, we love those. Um, but uh, there's a book called The Outsiders, not not the one that's the fiction book, but the it's called The Outsiders: Eight Unconventional CEOs and Their Radically Rational Blueprint for Success. I really like that book, and it, and it really kind of informs a lot of the way I approach business. Good question. Next one, uh, Pam. From Trizel. Hi, Trizel. Can I use my credit score and credit cards to purchase my first property? Or, not smart, my annual income exceeds 200K, but I'm in DC and have student loans from law school. So, can I, should they use their credit cards to purchase their first property? So, I, I do not. I, I think that you use, you match your debt product. If you're going to use debt to invest, you need to match the debt instrument with the nature of the investment. So, for example, I would not purchase an investment property with a HELOC unless uh, or a short term debt like a credit card. I would not use any type of short term debt to purchase a property unless I was going to flip it or burr it, in which case I'm going to get out of that loan in a short period of time and then refinance with a 30 year long term mortgage. So I would use a, a 15, 30 year, something that's a long term debt to purchase a property for buy and hold. And I would not use short-term financing, especially not variable interest rate, short-term financing to purchase something that I'm going to hold for a long period of time. I would definitely use, I, I might use a HELOC or a margin loan for my stock portfolio or something like that mm -hmm. to do a major improvement that I could then refinance afterwards mm -hmm. um, as a short-term gap solution, but I would not use uh, it for a long-term purchase. And I would definitely not use uh, credit credit cards um, to make that purchase either. Yeah, I agree though. Okay, Inspire Product Sync. Uh, what's the best finance strategy if you already own a home with equity and want to get started? I think you've nailed one of the biggest problems in the market right now. Up until last year, everyone had a ton of equity in their property, and the solution is obvious. You cash out refinance or you sell and 1031 exchange. Why doesn't that work in 2022? Well, interest rates have doubled. So I have the same problem. I have a property that has appreciated tremendously, but if I sell the property in 1031 exchange and I'm swapping my 3.2% mortgage yeah. for a yeah. six and a half or six, you know seven percent interest rate mortgage. If I uh, so if I 1031 exchange, if I cash out refinance, I've got the same problem. I don't think there's a great solution for this problem right now, and that's what the Federal Reserve wants. Is the Federal Reserve wants to shrink the money supply, right? And the way you shrink the money supply is by making it very disadvantageous for people like us to refinance our rental properties and take out these these things. That's how you combat inflation right. um, to a large degree. So I think I think that we're, there's some challenges here. I will give you some creative solutions. Um, first, um, and this is not attractive, you can get a private money loan, like a second. Uh, mortgage on your property, you can go to a, 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 an investor that's doing one of those. Uh, we just talked about this with the Lend to Live folks, Alex Brashears and uh, Beth Johnson um, from Bigger Pockets. And uh, you can go to a private money lender and they'll lend it to you, but it'll be eight to 10% interest. It'll be a second mortgage on that, but you, you better have a good use for those proceeds. Um, that's going to generate a big return um, because that's a very unattractive loan. Um, but it is out, it is out there um, is one solution. The second solution um, that I've heard, and I'm not very well versed in this, this will require more research from you. Um, but apparently there's a rule where if you sell a property and then you buy like a short term rental and you're very actively involved in that short term rental, 500 hours or 100 hours, and you're the most actively involved participant on that property. Um, there's a potential to, to do a cost segregation and use the uh, the depreciation, the bonus depreciation on that property to offset a lot of the capital gains if you do that in a year. That might be a good move for 2023, mm -hmm. not 2022, mm -hmm. because you don't have a lot of time left in 2022 to be that active in the property uh, unless yeah. you uh, uh, are really, really gung-ho about, about getting that advantage. And the yeah. third would be to sell a couple of properties, buy a much larger property, um, 
uh, like a like like a like an apartment complex, and then do the similarly do a cost segregation analysis on that very large okay. property. Um, okay. Be careful. You cannot. Uh, sell your property and then get a smaller property with a lower debt balance. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you're going to owe capital gains on the yes. reduction in boot, is what yes. that's called. Yes. So I think there are. I don't. I, I hope like those are wacky solutions um, well, that I just proposed. There, they're kind of there, but it's hard. Right. I don't think. I don't think investors have a good way to pull equity out of their properties right now. I think it's a major problem for anybody who's been investing and holding real estate for the last ten years. Um, well, I've been through four. I've been through. I've been through four of these cycles. And one thing I do know is that when the market turns, uh, it brings tremendous opportunities. And uh, especially for those people who can get financing and people who have access to financing. And uh, so now is the time, if you haven't done it already, to be position yourself to get access to money. OK, mm -hmm. uh, because as the market turns, a lot of investors, a lot of buyers go out and the sellers become more anxious. Uh, you can negotiate hard if you position yourself correctly. So if you've got equity in a house, okay, uh, I don't really, I mean, I've done that before where I've, uh, you know, had home equity lines and I've used those home equity lines during downturns to start buying more houses, doing the birth strategy, and then refinancing, uh, what's it called, accordingly to, to, to recycle the money. Because uh, a home equity, I mean, you've got, a lot, you've got an asset which has a lot of money. It's just sitting there doing nothing. And uh, I think savvy investors should take advantage of the downturn uh, because you want to buy when people are scared. Yeah, that's right. And, and the question from this from this uh, this person was again about their own home. So my advice is applying to rental properties. If you own okay. your home, the home equity line of credit is your obvious solution there for a lot of these things. Again, I wouldn't use it to buy a long term. I, to, to, to buy a long-term yeah. property. But yeah. I think that you're absolutely right. If there are opportunities coming up for value add, that's the yeah. best tool. And if it's, it becomes a buyer's market, that's going to be great. Setting yourself up to make sure you have access to that right now, making sure you have a strong cash position, all those other yeah. types of things, probably a good idea if you think that there's yeah. going to be um, a downturn in the market. But in general, I think it's much harder. There's much less attractive options to extract your equity from your portfolio today than there was a year ago. True. I agree. I agree. Next question, uh, Pam. Johnny H. Scott. What rope three software tools have you found helpful to self manage or renovate properties? May have to explain top three. <laughs> I yeah, I, rope three. <laughs> um, so, so I, I really like the bigger pockets tools, like the, the calculators, of course, and the rent estimator and those types of things. Um, as far as property management software goes, I've used Rent Ready, which I think is fantastic, and I used to use Cozy many years ago. Uh, as a software tool. I don't know how, um, I, I haven't used them in, in several years. So those would be the, the big ones that I've used um, to, to manage properties. For renovations, um, my favorite tool is my property manager and uh, who acts as a GC to renovate those properties. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't do much of that uh, personally. I've, I've used that, you know, uh, my favorite tool would be, you know, my drill um, and my <laughs> and hammer and, you know, my paintbrush, those types of things that I was, uh, that I did when I did the work myself. Okay. I was not very uh, sophisticated on, on that with that particular answer. So. Yeah, been there, done that. I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> okay. Uh, Tiana, um, what do you think about leveraging equity sharing? Equity sharing. Yeah. You know, this is a new model where, you know, the idea is, so, so I was talking about how, I, you know, you have trouble exiting one of these properties or, or cash out refinancing them. You could, I could change, exchange the equity of my properties for a share in a larger fund. They would take over management and I'd be truly passive. Um, I think that's an interesting option if you're ready to get out of this and you don't want to have a taxable event, for example, uh, on, on that. And you want an easy way to get out of actively managing. I think there's a place for that. Um, I just, I'm just not convinced that the equity share I'd put my properties into is going to perform better than the properties that I've carefully hand-selected, know, and uh, know, you know, know everything about. So not for me, but I think it's a, a really interesting solution. Okay. I think we're getting close to uh, 7.59. I'm going to throw a couple of Oh, I've got another question. <laughs> Scott, do you have a couple extra minutes or are you? I do. Yeah, I can, I can hang out if, you, if there's any more questions. Okay. Uh, Banji, what's the ideal strategy for someone who already has a primary residence but wants to get their first investment property? Uh, well, well, so so what this is a this is a big challenge, right? So again, uh, if if you agree with me that he, exchanging a HELOC in your primary residence as a down payment on your property, I really don't like that move. So I think that's where I think that's where this question is leading here. But here's why I don't like it. Let's say that I buy a two hundred thousand dollar property with a um, 
let's say a $240,000 property with a $60,000 HELOC. And that's at, you know, 5% interest rate. Well, I'm going to pay, what is that? $3,000 uh, a year in interest plus uh, $3,000 a year in interest. That might be 250 bucks a month um, in interest. That seems great. My, pro my property cash flow is more than 250. You know, maybe, maybe I buy that $240,000 place that cash flows 500 bucks a month. Well, wait, I still got to pay back the HELOC, right? Because it's, it's not a long-term debt instrument. So let's say that you want to pay it back over five years. Well, now I'm paying $1,000 a month on top of that. Think about how that wrecks your cash flow. I've already got a mortgage on the property and I've got to pay 250 bucks in interest, you know, which dwindles over time as the HELOC goes down. But I've also got to pay it back. And if it's, five, if it's over five years, I'm paying $1,000 a month to pay it back. That's, I mean, that's, that's going to bleed cash out of your life for the next five years, which is not why I get into real estate investing. Well, what Go if? Ahead. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. The interest is tax deductible. It's the business. Uh, you go on an asset that's probably going to appreciate in value. Uh, you know, so it's building your uh, net worth. Okay. There are tax benefits associated with owning that asset and owning the business. Uh, you may get a reduced cash flow. I get that. I agree with that one. But you're building, you have now two assets working for you uh, as opposed to one. And you are turning dead equity into active performing equity. Yes, there are some risks associated with that. You can't be cavalier. I agree, but I, I'm. I say I'm not a firm believer in your uh, 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 in your building phase. Okay, because we all go through different phases in life. Yeah, but it, during your building phase, I just personally, lo knowing what I know now, looking back, um, I would rather acquire several properties with less cash flow today and own those assets in five, 10 years from now, and thanking myself, I bought it when it was cheap, <laughs> but not buying it and regretting not buying it five years ago, if that makes sense. Um, because it, it, it is what it is. And I've just found that owning real estate, especially if you're savvy and incorporate some of the principles that you shared with us, uh, uh, Scott. You know, I mean, a wise man once told me, Joe, people always regret three things. They wish they started early, uh, they wish they bought more <laughs> and they regret not keeping more. And uh, so that's what my first real estate mentor told me. And that's the reason why I just got in. I wasn't making much cash flow, but I held on to the asset. And now I'm thinking, what? A, that's probably the best thing I ever did. So I, I, I can't argue with that, but I will say that in the next the, over the first five years, if you're paying back that HELOC, this property is going to suck cash out of your life um, during that period. You're not going to be accumulating cash. You're going to be paying back the HELOC. So, and that works really great if the if the properties are appreciating and and that, that never becomes an issue. But if if for some reason it becomes harder to get access to that HELOC or property values come down, this is going to be a position that's going to yeah. that's going to suck cash out of your life. So I don't like the HELOC, and I hear everything you say. I'm not arguing with it. I'm just well, saying for okay. me, I don't like the HELOC as a down payment option. What okay. I would do instead okay. is I would either take the sell the primary residence, yes. which would allow you to harvest a tax-free capital gain and then okay. buy another rental property with that um, or a house hack. I okay. would keep the primary residence and turn yeah. it into a rental because you yeah. probably got a great mortgage on that property. Yes. Or if none of those were an option, I would use the HELOC to buy an asset that needed a lot of work and mm -hmm. flip it or yeah. add value and then refinance the asset, yeah. planning on a six, 7% yeah. interest rate at the end so that you're okay. paying off the HELOC and getting right. a, a long-term debt financing. So yeah. those are my three options. Yeah. I don't, but, but, uh, but uh, yeah. to get there and hopefully they get close enough to what you're, <laughs> you're arguing there um, that, that we're not, we're not, uh, we're not uh, uh, philosophically opposed. We're no, just no, we just have no. some tactical differences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, exactly. Yeah. There's, there's, there's different ways to skin the cat, as they say. And uh, it depends on your situation. And uh, Scott gave some really, really good suggestions. And uh, I'm just sharing some of my experiences based on, you know, what I've learned. And uh, I mean, there's been some properties. I mean, you're in Denver. You're in an appreciating market over there. And uh, I, mean, it's, it's, I mean, I'll tell you this story, okay? Uh, in Washington, D.C., um, there was a house. In, it's about 120. I'll never forget the story. Uh, it's in the mid nineties. I could have bought it for 125 K and I didn't, um, uh, the, the seller wanted 126. I offered 120. 
we were haggling over six thousand bucks. Okay, six thousand bucks. That's what we we're haggling. I said no deal. <laughs> okay, fast forward today, that house on that block at almost like two million dollars. And uh, I mean, the, the the point is, is that when you're in the appreciating market, the assumption is that over time it will go up in value. It goes through cycles, but the general projection is that over time, especially longer, it probably will increase. Therefore, if you believe that. And if you have the historical evidence to support that, uh, it's not just you dreaming, but there's data to support that, then the key is to get in and uh, get in and hold it. Because years from now, you'll be regretting, I wish I bought when it was, quote, cheap, uh, 5, 10, 15 years, and you'd be kicking yourself. So it's, it's that, that's, that's where I'm coming from. If you can get in, get in. And you'll, as long as you have a strategy to hold it, You'll be okay. <laughs> I completely agree. I, I find it crazy that people are worried about my price is this, and I'm not going to buy it for a penny more. I mean, like, it, I bought that prop. I bought a property for two forty back in 2014. It's worth six hundred thousand now. It'll be worth yeah. millions by the time you know I'm yeah. sixty. So, like, what 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 am I doing? Like, am I am I going to fight him over two forty two versus two thirty eight? Am I going to fight him over six hundred exactly. today versus six oh four six you know five ninety six? But 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 the the caveat to that is. I, I never overextend. Yes. I'm never going to be in a position where I'm going to run out of cash because yes. in real estate, yes. the expenses hit you all at once. Yes. You're yes. going to, I shelled out, I, I didn't spend any money for, for three years on major yes. improvements. And then I spent like a hundred grand having to rehab multiple properties all at once. Yes. With yes. It. And it's like, boom, yes. boom, 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 yes. boom, boom. Right. And I so agree. that's your risk is you yes. want to buy from a position of financial strength. Yes. And if you have no cash left over, if you're yes. trying to buy a property and you, you're using your HELOC to buy that property exactly. and you don't have the, the capital structure to, to support it and you're yes. not cash flowing, yes. then you know, it works if you can hold it for 30 years, right? And and that's where you buy from a position of financial strength. Yeah. It, it doesn't have to produce a lot of cash flow, but it has yeah. to produce some cash flow yeah. of your yeah. situation. And you got to yeah. be able to hold it happily for that period of time, yeah. I think. Yes. Okay. I know it's getting kind of late. So let me ask a couple of final questions, Scott. This is to you. Uh, after after all is said and done, you know, what what would you like your legacy to be? What would you like to be remembered for? You know, after all these, I mean, you, you're building this uh, this organization. You're building your, um, you know, your portfolio. You're sharing a lot of wisdom on how to make money, build wealth. I mean, what do you want to be remembered for? Just curious. You know, that, that's really interesting. I have I have a, a set of lifetime goals that I've got here. You know, one of them is financial enough to, to have enough set up where I can have a, 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 a you know, and the, the goalposts keep moving. So I've already surpassed my but my 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 lifetime financial goals to a large extent. But in the next couple of years, I want to just round a couple of more corners with that. But it's really about, you know, can we build a, a, a business here at Bigger Pockets that changes a million lives, that creates a million millionaires, which I think is a you know, you may not be able to retire forever on a million dollars anymore, but you certainly have a flexible position with that. Right. So that's that's one that I'd like for from a bigger pockets perspective. And then I have you know fam family um, lifetime goals. I have you know health and fitness goals. You know, I want to I want to look like some of these uh, celebrities look when they're when they're eighty, uh, and and hopefully you know my face is has got some of these laugh lines on it that that are associated with a, a lifetime of, of smiles and laughs. So like I I have some cheesy ones like that. You know that I want to do. I want to I want I want to. Uh, uh, self-educate over a long period of time. And I want to have some, you know, I, I get really cheesy with it. I want to have some, like some frameworks for, for some big problems out there. Like, uh, like why, why is healthcare such a mess in this country? Like, can I, you know, can I just blog about that at some point? I know there's no, no politics or anything, but you know, can we, can I get into some things like that? So those are some things I'd like to accomplish outside of bigger pockets, um, okay. downstream is just, you know, health, fitness, and then a million millionaires through, through bigger good. pockets. We'll see what's next. Um, if there ever is next. So. Okay, good. Yeah. Cause my, my thing is to, you know, obviously it's to build wealth, but also to make a difference. Um, you know, I, I really, realize that you know we all can make a difference in other people's lives and uh you know we've been granted some opportunities and uh, i just i mean I, I just enjoy i met with one, one of my tenants today um and i try to meet with my tenants on the regular but just kind of check in see how they're doing and just build that relationship and it's just nice to hear how them being able to live in your home has made a huge difference in their life you know, the kids can be in a better environment and be in, you know, just the tra trajectory of where they're going. So that, that's just me is yes, I, I can make that. money, but also try to help a different, make a difference to other people's lives. 
Yeah, I love it. I think it's, you know, for me, if I were to say, to, to say it more succinctly for that, it's, it's how do you help high potential people achieve financial freedom early in life? Because they're going to go on to do cool things. Like we dangle this carrot. Oh, you're going to retire early and then you're going to drink margaritas on the beach. And we know that's complete <laughs> crap. These people are going to achieve financial freedom and then they're going to go and start a business or a nonprofit exactly. or, yeah. you know, run for office or yeah. whatever, or do something in their community that's going to solve problems. And that's, that's what's cool about yeah. this, this, this world of financial freedom. Okay, so with that said and done, uh, I want to thank Scott for a very intriguing, engaging discussion. Uh, if it's okay with Scott, I would definitely like to invite him again. Uh, we could continue the discussion maybe on a different topic. There's, you know, we, have, we share a lot of things in terms of our viewpoint, but I think there's some differences there. I'd mm -hmm. like to explore some of those differences. Absolutely. I think that'll be, a, that'll be a good discussion, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think a really engaged one. So again, with that said and done, Scott, is there any way if, if people want to engage with you, contact with you, uh, connect with you, how can they do that? Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram at, at Scott underscore Trench, or you can find me on Bigger Pockets. And I'm around the forums. I'm in the search bar. I respond to all the, the, the direct messages there. And uh, um, you can ask me questions or tag me in the forums, and I'll be happy to, to chat and comment there. Yeah. Thank you guys well, for the great questions. Yeah, Scott's not going to be at BPCon 22. Um, Got a baby I coming. Will, I will be there. Um, so I'll be speaking on um, the Section 8 model that I do, the Section 8 playbook. So if you're going to BPCon, listen to me, check me out, and engage with me. I look forward to uh, meeting all the Big Pockets community over there. And uh, so with that said and done, thank you, Scott. Scott, if you want to just stay on for a second. Thank you very much, guys. And have yourself a wonderful week. And I'll see you guys, everybody, on Wealth Wednesdays next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Okay? Thank you very much. Take care. Bye for now.